This second letter from Paul to Timothy was written around 64 AD. And Paul speaks of finishing his race and being poured out like a drink offering. So the overall tone of the letter is this last minute pep talk and encouragement and final charge for Timothy to do his duty and carry on the work. This was the last, obviously, the letter, last letter that Paul would write. He's nearing the end of his life. And if we start here with, uh, you know, after the greetings and all with uh, verse 3 in chapter 1, as usual, Paul identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus, and he speaks of Timothy as a dear child, and he's especially pleased with Timothy's non-pedantic faith. That's the meaning of the Greek word. It's uh, Hippocrates, but that means nitpicking. And this Greek word refers to mic micromanaging, I can't talk today, micromanagement and obsession with details and control. And that kind of faith is harmful and counterproductive, while Timothy's is genuine. That's what Paul's saying here. So this pure faith has been passed on to Timothy like a family heirloom on his mother's side. Since his father was Greek, the responsibility for keeping faith was clearly on his mother and grandmother, whose qualifications for the job were proved in Timothy. So it's this heritage that needs to be fanned into flame and empowered by the spiritual gift that he received. And it stretches credulity to think that Christian women lose this wisdom and honor if a male student is beyond a certain age, such that she who was once wise and instructive is now to be considered deceiving and seducing. This is what a lot of people teach. Even if this were true, it makes no sense at all to have the deceivable teach the vulnerable. Why would the scriptures have women teach children, as we'll see more about in the letter to Titus, if women are the least qualified to teach anyone because of being inherently deceivable and children being the most vulnerable, just the worst possible advice, if that were true. And of course, it's not true. So to think that women such as this could raise a Timothy only until he reached a certain and arbitrary biological age, at which point they were to keep silence, is to abandon all reason. So Paul's warning against cowardice now may indicate that Timothy was hesitant to take on his responsibilities, possibly because of his youth, but also undoubtedly because he's seen the suffering that Paul has gone through. So what Paul is saying is that to shrink back would mean to be ashamed of Jesus, and Timothy has to take this into consideration. Paul's loyalty and fearlessness were rooted in knowing who his Savior is and trusting God, not himself, to guard his deposit, as he puts it, till the day Jesus returns for us. And in other passages, he has defined this deposit as the Holy Spirit that guarantees our inheritance. This is what God keeps safe. And Paul continues to remind Timothy of all he has learned from him, whether by word or, or deed, so walking the walk and talking the talk, and he seems to hold up some bad examples as further motivation for Timothy to keep the, to the course. And then, of course, he gives some good examples to keep Timothy motivated. So that's pretty much uh, chapter one. Now let's go to chapter two. And once again, Timothy is charged with passing the teachings on, but not to just anyone. They have to be trustworthy and qualified people. Character is always the focus in any such instructions from Paul. So these people would have to also be willing to endure hardship just as Timothy would and Paul did. It's a package deal. These are the kind of people who are willing to go through that that you pass on these teachings to. The rewards come to those who earn them, which is only one of many instances in the New Testament that put responsibility on us for using the power God makes available to us. God will not cause spiritual growth without our cooperation, or there'd be no need for any of these warnings and encouragements. And of course, the ultimate example is Jesus, whose endurance of suffering is our model. But even if we falter, he will never disown us, Paul says here. And this is a promise we need to remember when we doubt our own faith. No matter what we do or don't do, God will remain faithful. So then Paul goes on to warnings against needless squabbling, which echo those of his first letter. And Timothy has to discipline himself to focus on the words that matter, and to recognize the great responsibility of understanding and teaching them properly. So if the word of truth were downloaded to us just because we have the Holy Spirit, as many people claim, then there have been no need to rightly divide, no need for teachers, no point in reading the Bible at all. 
People will say, I don't need any, you know, brand new believers will say, I don't need any teachers. I don't need to listen to elders because I have the Holy Spirit. Well, so do those elders, by the way. And also, then just throw the Bible away because you've got the Spirit, right? That's where that kind of so-called logic leads. There's a reason for these things. And then um, we'll go down to verse 16. And as before, Paul names dangerous teachers so others can take warning. But notice what this particular false teaching is, that the resurrection had already happened. It should be obvious that this is not referred to Jesus' resurrection, since that fact is what every saved person believes. Instead, it must refer to another resurrection, one that all his followers will experience. So the question is whether this resurrection refers only to the final one of all human history, or to the one known as the rapture. We've given, we are given a clue by the fact that these two false teachers were frightening people by telling them this event had already happened, and they missed it. Who would believe they had missed the violent end of human history? Or who would be upset if they missed the Great Tribulation? Nobody gets upset about those things. Only the rapture would explain how people could be fooled into thinking they missed a resurrection. And Paul reinforces the impossibility of something like that happening without our knowledge by reminding Timothy that Jesus knows who are his and he will not forget them or abandon them. Then Paul uses the illustration of common household containers to teach Timothy that our usefulness to God depends on our attitude. If we purge ourselves from the unsavory aspects of life and fill ourselves with good qualities, we'll do great things for God. But once again, this is our responsibility. God does not determine which kind of container we are per Calvinism, but uses us according to what we make available to him. It's our choice, but his power. We are to discipline ourselves like soldiers or athletes. Again, what is the need for that? If just because we have the Holy Spirit, then we have no need of anything else. But at the same time, Timothy must remember that this isn't something he can dictate to people. He has to be like Paul and lead by example. It's another quality to look for in leaders. So now let's go to chapter 3. And we see this familiar description of conditions in the last days that has often been cited as applicable to our time, and no one would dispute that. I mean, everybody agrees that life... In the time of Paul was hardly a bed of roses, so for him to put the last days in a class of their own means that the intensity and pervasiveness of these evils will be much worse. And this is a sign for us, so we need to pay attention. So when we're even worse than ancient Rome, which I think a good case could be made for that, we need to pay attention. This is a sign. And of particular importance is his statement about fake believers. We tend to forget that evil doesn't knock on the front door and hold up an ID card for us. It pretends to be one of us. It slowly introduces teachings that on the surface appear to be harmless or even beneficial. But one step leads to another, and one by one the false teachings replace the true ones. And as we learned before about gullible people, remember that, those without discernment will follow such teachers without question and they will accuse anyone who criticizes these false teachers of being hateful and negative and hindering the work of God. That's how it's been going. But the goal they and their teachers pursue will never be reached, Paul says, and we need to take Paul's warning seriously as the end approaches, which, again, we have been given signs for. That is the condition of mankind. So then he shifts back to Timothy again, and he urges Timothy to keep a tight grip on that which has been a part of his life from his earliest childhood. The sacred writings, the scriptures, are not dead letters or fables, but the living, breathing word of God, and they're meant to be used for our spiritual growth, whether by encouraging the good or rebuking the bad. It can be used for both. It's our spiritual owner's manual, and we can't only take the good pages out and get rid of the, the rest. So now let's go finally to chapter 4. This is not a long letter. And as if all that he has said hasn't been enough, Paul gives Timothy a solemn charge before God to stay at his post. This isn't optional or secondary. This is what the Christian leader is called to. Timothy is not to be a weekend warrior, but to see this as a lifetime commitment. And this charge is for every Christian leader, because as Paul warned, a time would come when there would be no tolerance for such teachings, a time that many would agree we have now reached. 
And keep in mind that these people who won't listen to the truth are found within the community of believers. These instructions have all been about how Timothy is to instruct the church, the congregation. And of course, there are other references to wolves arising from within the flock and scattering it. So we should be keeping our eyes peeled. At least the guardians should be doing that. And then Paul goes back to the example of his own life to motivate Timothy to stay the course. And again, he mentions the last days with reference to Jesus' sudden appearance, which the faithful will live in great hope of seeing. This is described as a hope that will earn a reward, one that Paul himself expected to have. But how many believers today live in the daily hope of Jesus' sudden return? It's really sad that there are so many who not only don't have this hope, but they're hostile to anyone who still does. Yet if Paul believed Jesus could return in his lifetime, it must be an event without prior notice, like a thief in the night. The signs mentioned earlier are for the nearness of the day of the Lord, and this is the event that precedes that, if we, if we have already gone over in uh, the study of Thessalonians. So now let's go down to verse 9, and Paul is nearing the end of the letter with his typical personal business and the joy of knowing that his sufferings have not been in vain. But notice his attitude towards someone who opposed his message and did him harm. Paul is confident that God will give the man what he deserves. Yet today, any believer who voices any such negativity is called hateful and unchristlike. Clearly, there is a place for righteous indignation and wishing for the enemies of the gospel to get what's coming to them. But can we accuse Paul of contradicting his earlier injunctions for Timothy to be gentle? No, instead, we must conclude that gentleness is for those who simply disagree on disputable matters, as he said there, while harshness is for those who oppose the gospel itself and do harm to the faith. This has been Paul's teaching and example. And as it says in James 4, 5, God opposes the proud, but shows grace to the humble. Are we not to follow God's example? So this is why in verse 16, Paul asked God not to hold anything against those who had abandoned him when he was on trial. There are reasons and times and situations in which to do either one or the other, to be either kind and gentle or harsh and strong. So then, of course, at the end here, Paul's uh, done training his apprentice, Timothy. He's done all he can do. And just think, finally, what it would be like if Christians since then would also have learned from Jesus' teachings through Paul.